we've been talking about uh, the Christian archetype, the Jungian commentary on the life of Christ by Edward F. Edinger. And we've done the first 12 chapters, and tonight we were going to do um, chapters 13 and 14, which are the last two chapters in the book. In order to do that, uh, I need to share a screen with you. Are you going to uh, talk about Buddha and the rest of them? Am or I is there some to... reason you've chose, chosen Christ? Well, because that's the name of the book. <laughs> the book is The Christian Archetype. So, um, so that's what we're talking about tonight. So the answer is uh, we may talk about the Buddha sort of peripherally here. But uh, what I'm sharing with you now is uh, what was in the beginning of this book uh, by Edinger, which is the incarnation cycle as in the Christian archetype. Now, let's understand what that means. It, what it means is that uh, what Dr. Edinger has done is gone back and looked at the works of art over the last 2,000 years that focused on specific times in the life of Christ. And he therefore considered them archetypal. And so in the last, uh, not last week, but the two previous weeks, we had gone through the first, all 12 in the cycle. And so now we're back at the top of the cycle and Christ is now dead, and so now we're going. We're starting the process with the Pentecost, with, with the Church considered to be um, the incarnation now. Okay, in other words, um, Pentecost comes, and and that's considered to be the birth of the Church, as I understand it, and. Now, Dr. Edinger's point is that now the life of the church over the past 2,000 years would go through these phases. So Pentecost was the Annunciation, which was 40 days after Christ's death, if I'm right. And, um, and so he came back and met with the... Met with the um, apostles, and uh, St. Thomas put his finger in the hand of Christ so that he could see because he was doubting Thomas. This is a medieval rendition of this where Christ has come down, and he's being represented by this dove, I believe, at the top of this image. And so everybody's looking up to Christ and so this is considered to be the birth of the church. Now, uh, I'm hoping that if I say something that's not right historically in Christian mythology, that, that someone, Nancy or someone, will stop me and correct me. Um, but in any case, um, in terms of the life of the church or, you know, the life of the reincarnation, I guess, is the way Dr. Edinger would put it. We're at the top of the cycle again at the Pentecost. Now, let me put this here. And, you know, I don't know how any of you know this or might have experienced this in your Christian education. I never got it in my Christian education, I have to tell you very honestly. Or, and I never got it. You know, I'm involved with Christian adult education right now, and I've never seen this. So I got to get that book. It's a fascinating, and I, I see it. I see the truth in it, Skip. It's great. Right. And so, so anyway, the, the significance of this is that Dr. Edinger is saying that the Pen Pentecost represents the birth of the church. And, um, and Dr. Jung said this basically uh, to Per Lachat in a letter. Now, all of Dr. Jung's letters to the pastors late in his life in the 50s 
1950s were um, hidden by the Jungian community. So of the 14 that are important and Dr. Yo and Dr. Edinger pulled out, seven of them appear in volume 18 of the collected works and seven of them were never published. It happens that this particular letter, letter to Père Lachat, uh, is carried in volume 18 at paragraphs 15, 52 and following. And uh, Jung says, and this is the lead up in this, in this chapter, so I'll read it to you again. Origen said that the three persons, that the Father is the greatest and the Holy Spirit the least, this is true inasmuch as the Father, by descending from the cosmic immensity, became the least by incarnating himself within the narrow bounds of the human soul. The littleness of the human, uh, I'm sorry, the littleness of the Holy Spirit stems from the fact that God's pneuma dissolves into the form of little flames, remaining nonetheless intact and whole his dwelling in a certain number of human individuals and their transformation into sons of God. It says Hanoi to Theo, but I guess that's Hebrew for sons of God. Right. Um, signifies a very important step forward beyond Christocentrism. On the level of the sun, there is no answer to the question of good and evil. There is only an incurable separation of the opposites. It seems to me to be the Holy Spirit's task and charge to reconcile and reunite the opposites in the human individual through a special development of the human soul. And that is for some of us to recognize um, the, the movement of the human spirit of the Holy Spirit within us. And uh, if I'm understanding correctly, I think Nancy feels that that's happened to her. To a limited degree, I feel like it's happened to me. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm just feeling my way on this. Um, you know, I'm wondering uh, on that last <laughs> sentence, where it talks about the Holy Spirit's task and charge to reconcile and reunite the opposites in the human individual through a special development of the human soul. It almost sounds like he's talking about the conjunctio. Yes, surely. That is what he's talking about. Um, and I, I think Edinger addresses this in other places, but yes, I agree with that. And, but first of all, What's that word you said, conjunctio? Conjunctio, as in Mysterium Conjunctionis. It's the conjunction. It, it, literally, it's, um, it's a Latin word which means conjunction, and what it represents is um, both good and evil, both being part of, a, of two sides of one coin, basically. If, yeah if I could simplify that. Thank and, you. And so the task of the modern human being is to recognize the Holy Spirit and, um, and to start making this change. Now, that was supposed to happen at, immediately after the Pentecost in, in the Apostles, but somehow the church did it instead, or you know, took over instead, and so it emphasized the summa bonum, uh, the you know, the summation of all good, and it um, it stated that you know there's no such thing as evil, that it's privatio boni, that um, that you know, evil doesn't exist. And of course, we now know through centuries of bloodshed and very terrible bloodshed in the 20th century that, you know, <laughs> evil certainly does, manifest evil certainly does. Uh, lies and sticking. 
is alive and ticking. And uh, if you see it spread upon the earth, then you know. And so the question is how to bring the good and the evil together so that they allow the human species to be enlightened. And, and Skip. recognizing, just a second, recognizing that the evil is in all of us. Okay. So go ahead, Miles. Yeah, what I wanted to add or share is that I find it so numinous that I encountered you um, when I did, because as you know, I've been very much involved with what's known as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission here in right. Canada mm -hmm. with respect to the way the indigenous peoples have been mistreated right. for the past 150 years, 250 years, depending how far back we go. You know, initially when the Europeans landed, there was a mutual respect and they worked together, you know. Um, and, then, and then power, the Europeans uh, got possessed by the not the light not seeing the light of the indigenous people and the way their ways but they they were um seduced by the concept of power the dark power shall we say yeah. the power and, yep. and so you know my situation was this whole truth and reconciliation commission had me confronting my own christian beliefs because I was very Christocentric. And mm -hmm. in fact, I thought I had settled my Christian conflict or paradox when I, you know, came to the resolution that that in spite of the schism between the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, that you know it's finished it doesn't matter the, the the message i got when you know i had my satori moment with jesus was don't worry about it it's finished you know because my wife was roman catholic i was going to eastern orthodox and, and they said well you know you can't be eastern orthodox if you marry in the roman catholic church so, anyway so i thought okay i've i resolved this conflict but then between denominations that um, it doesn't matter to jesus but then i was confronted with whether or not the creation stories of the indigenous people are to be equally respected or am i to remain in my christocentrism so you see i've i've had to confront this christocentrism and that's exactly what you were talking about here on your channel so it's a huge it's a huge revelation in my heart i felt you know, my experience with indigenous people is they are kind, loving people. So why would they not be saved? Why is it that their God image, the God within them, they know their God as the giver of life? Why shouldn't their creation stories be equally respected? And this entire conversation, or, you know, your Jungian channel, mm -hmm. is, is all about that. So it's like, wow, you know, this is... Right moved yeah. me tremendously and um so yeah, the whole I'm, point is we have to stop looking away from each other and turn back toward each other and see what we all know because exactly. we all know something and now i just point out you know in the in this annunciation chapter just prior to what you read indeed a roman catholic um authority i don't forget what his name was but you read it in this chapter on the youtube channel and mm -hmm. and he's saying oh there's not going to be any more revelation it's all finished you know we just we just have to uh, sit around waiting for the end of times or end of church and in fact when i went over to a, a, a more of a, a evangelical persuasion of christianity in fact i was listening to these pastors today and it's for them it's you rest in the grace of Jesus Christ. And that's where I was. And it's a very comfortable place to be. But interesting, 
that I heard a story at a presentation just the other day where this young gentleman is talking about, it was a graduation award ceremony type thing, a scholarship being awarded. And he, this young fellow talks, gives a little presentation about the, the chained elephant. You chain a baby elephant for the circus as a baby, and it will know that it's chained after, you know, a, a few months of trying to pull free. And then it doesn't matter as this big elephant gets huge, you don't even have to, you just put the chain on it. It doesn't even have to be tied to anything secure. The elephant just knows it's chained. So anyway, to me, that's sort of this wrong message of Christocentrism in that, yeah, okay, you can rest in Jesus Christ, but that doesn't mean you don't have an obligation to reconcile. Right. Yeah. So uh, for the other panelists, uh, I'd like you to welcome uh, Art Patterson, I think it is, right, Art? Um, and Art has uh, a, a disability that involves his speaking. And so he can't really uh, articulate himself so I can hear it and understand what he's saying. Uh, but he has been a very uh, loyal follower of both the YouTube channel and, um, uh, well, especially these Monday night sessions. And um, so I've included him in the panel, and uh, most of you have not seen him up till now. In fact, this is the first time I've seen him. But So I want to welcome you, Art. Welcome, uh, Art. Good welcome. to see you. He also welcome, Art. He, he also has a uh, chat comment. Okay. Uh, it says, do you think that the Holy Spirit is still working today? Yes. And my answer to that is very definitely it is. And, um, and I, I, I'd like to just mention something about the charismatic movement in the Catholic Church. I was just looking on Wikipedia before our meeting, and in 2013, the Catholics had 230 countries for, that were experiencing the charismatic movement and 160 million members. Well, it certainly sounds like Jung's prediction of the time of the Holy Spirit is at hand. I'm sorry. Well, you know, Nancy, Go that's ahead. an interesting... And it's interesting you say that, Nancy. I think this is a numinous time in the Catholic Church. I'm a I work for the church full time, and I um, see spiritual movements all over the world, and I think it's all the same spirit. I think the fact that you're sitting here right now interested in this movement of the spirit, you're sitting in Reno, I'm sitting in Annapolis. Um, a few weeks ago, um, Skip was talking about the movement of the Holy Spirit in South Korea, in a boy band. I mean, the Holy Spirit isn't picky about denominations. Right, and nationality. And, or age groups. Right, and but, Jerome, Jerome is working very heavily on that. Um, it's a great time to be alive and be, uh, be aware that you are alive. Yeah, there's millions of youth uh, being uh, affected by the uh, group VTS, which is a, a Korean uh, pop group, and they've been uh, acting out different things of Jungian archetypes that were written by Herman Hesse, which was a student of Jung, and they also have uh, a map of the soul that was written by Murray Stern, uh, Murray Stein, excuse me, uh, and the youth are reading these books and they're understanding how the archetypes interface with each other. And the music is portraying this in a dramatic uh, felt effect. You know, it has resonance with these uh, youth and they can see the trials and tribulations that they have to go through. And it's all about uh, mental health in terms of uh, helping these people and they formed their own support group, which is called army. And you've got millions of, uh, 
people supporting and they have someone to go to and talk to if they feel like they have a mental health problem. And yeah. we're talking about millions of uh, people being affected by this. Yeah. And there's like, uh, uh, there are like 230 or something army help centers around the world in, um, at least 20 languages and yeah. so if somebody puts in uh, puts in a request for aid on twitter and they put in the name of an army help center uh, then someone live will start interacting with them immediately especially if they're feeling nihilistic or suicidal or something like that yeah, it just it, it supports all languages and different cultures, and it's just amazing how it's spread out, and it's still spreading. Yeah, and I and I think it will even further become. Uh, let's see, um, I'm just in the middle of something else, but it will even further because I think their next album will be um, also, but this time about the shadow. Yeah, right. that's the, the previous rumor. album was about the persona, and the the guess is that their next uh, album will be about the shadow. Yeah, I think they're just going to walk down through Mary Stein's uh, individuation process. Yeah, it seems so. Through. And you know that, of course, is very exciting. And um, so I'll also say, you know, when it when the at Pentecost when there was all these tongues being spoken in many different languages of people from many different countries. What I believe we have to recognize is that this Holy Spirit will manifest itself all around the world. And so, for example, Truly. the Haudenosaunee of the Iroquois Confederacy, they have a legend of a great peacemaker. And when I heard this story, you could look up faith keeper Oren Lyons. He's a gentleman of probably close to 90 years old. He was interviewed on PBS by, um, who's that gentleman that had the series for many years? Oh, um, Moyers, Bill Moyers? Bill Moyers, yeah. Look up Bill Moyers on YouTube interviewing Chief uh, Faith Keeper Oren Lyons. And listen to this story of the great peacemaker and tell me that that doesn't sound like Jesus Christ. Now, I raised this to these pastors on basic gospel, and I could even generate the recording because I believe it still exists. And I said, this sure sounds like Jesus in a different kind of incarnation. And uh, uh -oh. some Sorry. music. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> anyway, just to wrap up, um, he the, the pastor. The pastor said, um, "Well, he would identify himself as Jesus Christ." Well, I'm thinking, well, we don't know that he can. He could show up. This Holy Spirit can show up in any language in different names. This incarnation cycle, though, this Holy Spirit, though, can be repeated in Korea. It can be repeated in the indigenous world uh, anyway I and that's like why the christocentrism an example, an example of what miles is saying uh, jack hayford many years ago was uh sharing the gospel in russia and after he talked about jesus christ a woman came up to him and said i know him but i didn't know his name so the spirit had already been there to her mm -hmm. And of course, when the Holy Spirit, I mean, when Christ sent the Holy Spirit, then there was not that concrete center. It was now spread abroad in the Holy Spirit and uh, could be taken in by every individual. I know my own experience of uh, the baptism in the Holy Spirit was very joyful and came with the uh, gift of speaking in tongues, which I still use today, to praise God and to pour out my uh, sorrows. Uh, 
So there is an opening. My experience is, and as I think about it in Jungian terms, uh, the ego self-axis is uh, alive and at work, even though I didn't know anything about Jungian psychology at the time. Right. So, uh, Nancy, I wonder if you would just explain that um, a little bit more, what, what your experience of speaking in tongues has been, because you're the, I mean, I've heard people speak at t- in tongues at fundamentalist rallies, but uh, I never really understood it until you explained it. So I think it's worthwhile to have you explain it for the purposes, maybe everybody else heard it from this group, but uh, for the purposes of the video, it's worth people being conscious of what it means. Because a lot of a lot of people that hear about it think it's wacko. And I don't think it's wacko, and I especially don't think it's wacko after hearing you talk about it. But Well, uh, I'm not sure exactly what I said, but uh, the, it, the speaking in tongues is like the ego being shifted off to the side and the unconscious allowed to speak. So this is coming forth from a deep place within. Uh, generally, when someone prays for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they are longing for an intimate connection with Jesus. And so their heart is already open and longing, and they pray and ask Jesus to baptize them in the Holy Spirit. And in many cases, this uh, language just springs forth very naturally, and it, but not in everyone. It's not a necessary thing to prove that you are a follower of Jesus. Right. Uh, but it is, it is, it's very life-giving. It's very much like um, springs of living water within me, just flowing and cleansing me. Right. So uh, Penelope has joined us. So, uh, and I'm sorry if I seem distracted the last two minutes, a few minutes, because Penelope was in contact with me and, and, uh, I wanted to give her access to the panel here so that she could introduce herself. And Penelope lives in London, so it's late there. Penelope, what are you it's doing? 2 a.m. 2 a.m. Yeah, I wouldn't I mind actually mentioning something that happened to me last night. I was having a bit of a breakdown of sorts, and a, a bit of an emotional thing. And what I did, I couldn't sleep, and I bought a Bible of about... Um, about a week ago, I bought a really beautiful Bible, leather bound, mm-hmm. and I put it on my, I laid on my bed and I put it on my heart and I went off into the most beautiful sleep. Hmm. And um, it was a really touching experience for me. I was quite shocked at the, the calming. I was very, I don't know why I did that, but I felt I needed comfort. I was in a, not a breakdown, but a very emotional, highly place. So it was a really beautiful experience. Right. When so, I heard, um, I don't know, actually, the late Nancy, when I heard the little bit you just said, that's what I was referring to there. Mm-hmm. Let, let me just give a little further introduction to Penelope, because the rest of us are old timers <laughs> in this group. <laughs> and, and so Penelope uh, has a YouTube channel mainly about PTSD, uh, and also uh, she does astrology, um, very detailed readings of astrology. And uh, I did interview Penelope once, I think, and and that interview is on the website, but, uh, or on the YouTube channel, but um, she and I have been interchanging for quite some time on these issues. And so that's why I've invited her into the webinar tonight, because she's not just a stray that I brought in off the street. (laughs) And uh, so if each of you would uh, just quickly introduce yourselves to Penelope, that would be very nice. Well, I'm Jerome and from North Carolina, and I've talked with you, uh, well, by email before, 
in terms of some uh, references like Donald Cowshed about VSTD and Yes, I did follow that up as well. I bought the trauma and the soul, and I read it. Um, oh, yeah, I read wonderful. the whole book. It changed me, actually. Oh, great! Yeah, that's really wonderful. helped me. Yeah. So, anyway, so I enjoyed your interview and and also conversing with you by email. And yeah, thank you. Uh, particularly on uh, today is uh, celebration our warriors and stuff and. It's really relevant today. Uh, there's been some pieces on PSTD on uh, the news and so forth, and what can we do for our veterans to help them? Yeah. I'm, yes. <laughs> absolutely. De Deb pulled up a, a. It turned out to be an old meme because Donald Trump was still a presidential candidate, but apparently he had made the comment that soldiers who get PTSD. Um, just can't handle combat. Now this is this is uh, General Bonespurs here, who wow. <laughs> obviously <laughs> obviously can't handle combat <laughs> either. But um, you know my my personal experience with PTSD from combat, uh, I can tell you that it is not a joke and it doesn't go away. Uh, one learns to. Uh, deal with it. Um, and fortunately for me, um, I had a very mild experience relatively in, in Vietnam and compared to a lot of people, including my roommate who was killed. Um, but, um, and I came back from Vietnam not thinking that I was in any way uh, in trouble. And um, I, um, I went with my ex-wife the following summer uh, out on the Niagara River for the 4th of July fireworks. And uh, her father's, in her father's boat. And um, when the fireworks started, it freaked me out so badly that I wanted to jump out of the boat, literally. And ever since then, um, I have been unable to listen to or view or listen to fireworks live. I can watch it on television um, because then it's just a pretty picture mostly. Uh, but if, if I'm witnessing fireworks live, it just uh, spooks me out. That's one thing. And then frequently here we have helicopters flying by and so anytime a helicopter flies by boom I'm right back in Vietnam and I left Vietnam on April the 12th 1971 so that gives you a sense that it hangs on for a while <laughs> that's 48 well, PTSD plus. PTSD can also be with certain rape victims as well Yes. Certain things can trigger them, and right. yes. uh, they, they can they can be right back in the situation. That's what I've. That's what the the type that I'm working with them um, with the childhood trauma with people. So that's what I do on my. I I'm helping from that experience of being able to help people, which is very good that I've got a voice. I've got a could voice. Could you could you put in the chat, Penelope, uh, a link to how to get to you? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Penelope, uh, I have, I'm a survivor of childhood uh, abuse and that's the type of PTSD that I've been living with. Um, Complex. And, and uh, coping with every day with a variety of things. But I wanted to say two things. My name's Brendan. I want Hi, to say Brendan. two things on top of that. One is um, I have next to my desk... Um, and I look at it every day, something yeah. that speaks to your Bible incident, uh, because the reason you had a beautiful sleep last night is what you projected into that um, Bible as much as anything else. And uh, I, do you know the poem Love Dogs by Rumi? N no. I'm going to read it for you if you don't mind. Okay. One night, um, one night a man was crying Allah. His lips grew sweet with praising until a cynic came to him and said, So, I've heard you calling out. Have you ever had any response? 
The man had no answer to that. He quit praying and fell into a confused sleep, dreaming he saw Kidra, a guide of souls in the thick green foliage. Kidra said, why did you stop praising? The man said, I never heard anything back. The longing you express is the return message. The grief you cry out from draws you toward union. Your pure sadness that wants help is the secret cup. Listen to the moan of a dog for its master. That whining is the connection. There are love dogs no one knows the names of. Give your life to be one of them. Uh. Give your life, okay. I would like to read that um, as well. I, I will look for that. I'll write what, it down. I'd what like what to... is it called again, Brendan? What is the name of the poem? Love Dogs. Rumi. Rumi. And Nancy, I will do my details. I haven't done before on, um, I guess, what I would do. Um, maybe, are you, are you on social media, Nancy? Not too much. I, I do have a YouTube channel that I post videos to. Well, but... can I... Can I find you on there and then I'll comment on a video? I could, I'll put in the chat my uh, email address okay. for you to contact me. That would be that good. Would, would that work? Yes, I've, I haven't done chat before on Zoom, so that was my only thing. Okay, so um, see. just put your cursor down at the bottom of the screen, yeah. right, at the bottom of the Zoom screen, chat. and that will open up oh, a okay. bunch of things. Oh, and okay, chat. I see. Okay. And you can actually okay. pull that to the side, and then you can just watch the chat as it. it goes. So I could put my email in. Yeah. I'll do mine. Okay. Uh, so anyway, let us uh, return briefly. Um, I guess, uh, Miles, did you introduce yourself? I guess you did. I, I'll just uh, say I'm here in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And in the mid 1990s, I realized I really didn't have a spiritual foundation of anything. And so I became a seeker. I went, ended up in the Eastern Orthodox Church, an English speaking Eastern Orthodox Church. And I was, my wife, she thinks I just went there because they had a meal after every service, <laughs> which when I was single, <laughs> that's probably a big that's always good. But if you want to really learn about everything that's illustrated on the uh, cycle there, the 14 steps now, I might reserve though, how, I can't recall how they view the assumption of Mary, but because they have their whole year mapped out with feasts and festivals, um, they pretty much repeat all of these, the cycle every year. And, uh, you know, I'm, the, you would be welcomed, you know, don't anyone listening to this, go to an Eastern Orthodox church. They'll welcome you. They, they, they won't try to impose their religion on you. But if you want to learn about the Bible, I think it's a good place to go. But anyway, that's a little bit about me. Ultimately, though, as I was saying, I'm just tickled to have discovered Skip and Carl Jung because I'm now going to a higher level of consciousness. Now, I don't say that boastfully, but this moving away from Christocentrism and saying or seeing that I don't know that Jesus wanted us to make a religion out of him, but be religious about the highest form of love, this agopic love, and, and to see it in, in the world at large and in other people. And right. you know, at the same time, share the story, what we're seeing here, share this incarnation cycle. Right. And so what, just say, you know, I, it relates to who you are already. Thank you. Right. 
And uh, Penelope Art, who you see here is Galaxy S9, uh, has uh, some... Um, Cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy, okay, that's good. Is it, no, what was the art? Was that art? The name? Yes. Yes. I like that. Uh, is it, hi there. Is it short for yeah. Is art short? Is it a short version? Art. Art. Yeah, artist. 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 A R T I S. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Artist. Neat name. It is a neat name. Yeah. 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 And. Um, I wanted to share that I knew about the Holy Spirit from a Pentecostal church, but now I'm in a independent. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here, and uh, okay. it's not a but yeah, I think the Holy Spirit is in everybody, regardless, and I think we need to understand that part. Mm -hmm. So, um, something that Art uh, put in the chat was about the Holy Spirit. If I got this right, Art, if the Holy Spirit comes in whether you're gay or straight, it's not gender preferred. And my own experience of the divine feminine arising this year is that the spirit is the gender of the person it inhabits. So there's, uh, there's no prejudice where the Holy Spirit is concerned. That's beautiful, Pena. Beautiful, Nancy. Right. That's beautiful, Nancy. I'd also like to add with, to what Art was saying and Nancy was saying about this Holy Spirit. The very last word in chapter 4 that Skip read, or um, chapter 14 of the, uh, uh, the Assumption of Mary, the last word is reconcile. Mm -hmm. Reconcile. That, to me, is what this Holy Spirit is all about. That's what we're to do. And that's this reconciling of these opposites. They're all over the place. You know, the red, right. the blue, as Skip talks about in mm -hmm. Canada, it's the, um, the, the settler people and, of, and the First Nations people. It's Russia and the United States with Canada in the middle. You know, I, yeah. I, if, that, if they start launching the nuclear weapons, I'm sitting right in the middle of it. They yeah, that, the pole. That's the conjunctio that we were talking about earlier. Um, <clears throat> so, um, but what I wanted to get through here is just to say, uh, so I'm going to put this up one more time uh, before we move on to Mary, because Mary is obviously important. Um, so, Edinger's main point here is that the church has now also been through this entire cycle and um, was crucified, dead, and buried after Nietzsche. And the, uh, you know, the 20th, 20th century. And so now we have to understand where the incarnation cycle is going to take place now. And you know, Dr. Jung's point is that it's starting in average men and women now. And, um, and that's, and so in psychology, he calls it the individuation cycle. And, and so that's the point of this whole thing. And, but as long as we have preachers going around saying it's my way or the highway, we can't, you know, we, we shout down that process of the Holy Spirit. And actually, there's a, there's a 
incident recounted in uh, Liberating the Heart by Lawrence Yaffe, where uh, Dr. Jung was seated next to a Roman Catholic bishop at his last appearance at, um, in the United States at the Plaza Hotel. And he asked the Roman Catholic bishop what the church was doing about the, Rom uh, the Holy Spirit. And the bishop said, oh, we don't do much about that anymore, or something like that. What a that. tragedy. What a tragedy. Yeah. And, uh, and meanwhile, um, meanwhile, uh, when I was talking with Paul Vanderclay one time, uh, we were talking about the Pentecost, and he said, well, the only people that are were sons of god and and uh and deputized to be the holy spirit were the people that were actually at the pentecost and uh you know again what a tragedy and so i just uh, mention here uh from uh thomas Arth's essay in young's red book for our time Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions, he highlights something that Dr. Jung said to the Reverend Morton Kelsey. Again, this is another of the letters that I uh, read into the cha channel on the playlist called uh, The New God Image, but, um, but here's a brief excerpt. Quote, we are still looking back to the Pentecostal events in a dazed way, instead of looking forward to the goal the Spirit is leading us to. Therefore, mankind is wholly unprepared for the things to come. Man is compelled by divine forces to go forward to increasing consciousness and cognition, developing further and further away from his religious background because he does not understand it anymore. His religious teachers and leaders are still hypnotized by the beginnings of a then new eon of consciousness instead of understanding them and their implications. What one once called the Holy Ghost is an impelling force creating wider consciousness and responsibility and thus enriched cognition. The real history of the world seems to be the progressive incarnation of the deity. And so I always thought that that's a pretty profound paragraph. Yes. And, um, and so with that, I mean, that's a reference to the Pentecost. So we can go on to the last chapter here, which, is, which Miles is chopping at the bit to talk about. <laughs> is he still here? There he is. Yes, he is. <laughs> so so the assumption um, of the Virgin Mary into heaven, um, does anybody want to talk about it besides me? I mean, I have a few things to say about it. But. I would say that um, whenever I hear preaching about the assumption, and because of my job, I'm obliged to attend at least two or three services every assumption, um, everybody talks about it being a human, um, an intrinsically human celebration that talks about the potential for the human to become one with the divine. It's, it's about the whole human, not the soul, the whole body and soul, the whole thing. A non-dual divination of a human being. I think that's what I want to say. Right. And so, um, yeah, go ahead, Nancy, you want to say anything about it? Or do you, I guess well, a question I, I was for you. Not a, I was not a Catholic until about 1998. So I missed out on that change. But I will say that when I pray the rosary, it's very much a connection with the divine feminine for me. Mm -hmm. Even though the mysteries relate to Christ's life, uh, the Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. 
Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. As one goes through that, there's a sense of uh, you get out of the words, you get out of the, something begins to happen within you, and there is this life flowing through you. Uh, I suppose some people can just do it very concretely, but I experience a real sense of the divine feminine through that uh, practice. Right. And Brendan, what you said and, was so beautiful about and, the assumption. And this was the point um, of Dr. Young's end, kind of ending in um, answer to Job, um, which is the last three, or not the last three, but three key paragraphs, uh, which is 752 through 754. Um, without, I mean, he made a, a number of comments about um, Protestantism uh, in it. Uh, in 752, he mentions that he thinks that the Assumption of the Virgin Mary into heaven, which occurred in 1950, thanks to Pope Pius XII and his papal bull. Um, the <laughs> I, always, I always have to chuckle when I hear that term, but anyway, his declaration in 1950. Um, Dr. Jung considered that the most important religious event since the Reformation. And he also said, and here, here's, the, um, here's the key part about Protestantism. What, at, what outrages the Protestant standpoint in particular is the boundless approximation of the di, di, diapara to the Godhead and in consequence, the endangered supremacy of Christ from which Pro Protestantism will not budge. In sticking to this point, it has obviously failed to consider what its hymnology is full of references to the heavenly bri bridegroom, who is now suddenly supposed not to have a bride with equal rights, or has perchance the bri bridegroom in true psychological manner um, or psychologistic manner, been understood as a mere metaphor. Um, and then he goes on, chapter 753, I'll let you read that on your own, but he's again swiping the Protestants. But uh, then uh, he sums up Mary's role and says, at any rate, her position satisfies the need of the archetype. The new dogma expresses a renewed hope for the fulfillment of that yearning for peace, which stirs deep down in the soul, and for a resolution of the threatening tension between the opposites. Everyone shares this tension, and everyone experiences it in his individual form of unrest. The more so, the less he sees any possibility of getting rid of it by rational means. It is no wonder, therefore, that the hope, indeed the expectation of divine in intervention arises in the collective unconscious and at the same time in the masses. The papal declaration has given comforting expression to this yearning. How could Protestantism so completely miss the point? Um, and I'll leave it to you to read on in that paragraph. Well, I'll, I'll add... Um... So I'm, I married my wife in a Roman Catholic church, and I agreed that my children would, could be raised in the Roman Catholic faith. They've gone to Roman Catholic schools. Again, I was enamored with the Eastern Orthodox Church before all this began. Then I, you know, I've never, I don't subscribe to the Roman Catholic Church. So I've been to Baptist churches. I got baptized in a Baptist church. And... Indeed, I was convinced that, oh, this Hail Mary stuff is all wrong. You know, you can't be worshiping Mary, you know, because that was this Baptist indoctrination that I had. And in fact, I had to participate in stuffing 
these little rosary beads into these bags. It's part of a little annual fundraiser for the marching band. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I had to do it with like, nah, I'm doing this against my will, you know, because like, I don't, you're not supposed to be, you know, elevating Mary. So anyhow, <laughs> but now, you know, having okay. encountered what you've been talking about and, and uh, getting this Jungian perspective, now I'm thinking, well, yeah. And something I'd like to add, you know, by chance, I pull up, a, I'm constantly doing research, and I actually pulled up a presentation of yours, Skip, from April 16 of this year. Why is individuation so important? Part two, and what is fate? And let me read what you said, minute 43 to 30 seconds. You said, metaphorically, all women represent the tree of life because only women can reproduce life. That tree of life is all women. You know, and so in a sense, I'm, you know, you you can accuse me of being sexist, but I'm going to say that women by their nature, from what I just read, in a sense, your being is is almost an individuation itself like the just the if you do give birth that has got to be like viewed as a huge individuation milestone for anyone right whereas us men i'm going to say you know we have to actually we got to come up with something you know to be um, anywhere even in the ballpark of what it is to give life. Um, well, or, or so to, anyway. To individuate. I mean, yeah, that's what and we have to individuate. I mean, it, it's sort of interesting that one of the songs that we heard at the concert we attended last Saturday or Friday night is um, Riding Shotgun Down the Avalanche of Life. This was two women that Debbie and I have followed for 30 years. And uh, that was uh, Sean Colvin's most popular song. And she sang it again. It, it so happened that we, um, uh, that we were at their first concert together uh, on August the 9th, 1989. And so when they were going to perform again together last Friday, I gave Debbie tickets to that show, and it was probably the most delightful concert uh, I've ever attended because um, these two women, the other woman was Mary Chapin Carpenter, and you may have heard her heard of her because she has won various Grammy and, and country music awards over the years. Um, and um, and on that occasion, because we we remember it very clearly, because uh, Mary wished Debbie a happy birthday on that first time that these two women were together, and the reason she did was because she was then working at a nonprofit where uh, a friend of ours worked. <laughs> <laughs> who conned her into say wishing Deb a happy birthday from the stage. But in any case, this concert, um, they didn't they didn't really bang it out like a, like one would expect a professional music room. It was like um, because this is the home venue for both women. Um, it's called the Birchmere in Alexandria, Virginia, and it's uh, it's almost as famous as the Grand Ole Opry, especially around here. But um, but because it's like their home venue and they've played there so many times, uh, they just played the concert as though it was a, it was a, a gathering of friends. was really beautiful but anyway um, women if they do marry or if they don't marry either way I suppose um, if they do conceive or not um, 
get pushed down this avalanche of life. And, you know, Debbie, my wife for the last 30 years, um, never had children. And, um, you know, for her that, that works for a variety of reasons, which I don't have to go into here. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, but it can, um, you know, one can find uh, meaning in one's life without having children is what I would, can what I, I, can what I, I say, would say. Yes, please. Because I find, I mean, I haven't, and I'm, I find a lot of women who, from my own knowing, women of my age, 53, 50, who've not, and it seems to be there, you know, the, there's a generation that seems to have skipped that, skip, skipped that little bit of, mm -hmm. and nobody's ever asked to marry me. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's, and that can create, you know, that, that's sad too. You know, the expectancy of being, you know, desired, you know? Right. Maybe, maybe not, but it's almost like forces you then into, into individuation, I guess, not for everybody, but it's forced, it's made me into a loner, which has pushed me into seeking something else other than relying on relationship to be fulfilled. Could I say something else though, that is an observation? I'm not a psychologist or a sociologist, hmm. but it seems to me more often than not, it is the divine feminine that is leading the call for change and reconciliation. You know, you have Greta Thunberg. Yeah, you sure. have um, a, a Autumn Peltier, a First Nations young woman here in Canada, uh, a water protector. Um, you have women at the front lines of so many of these environmental initiatives. Now, I'm not saying there's not men there too, but I don't know when it comes to this, this arrow spirit and this divine feminine. Yeah, there's a bit of that in me, but I, you know, I'm, I'm, I will never be leading, you know, a spiritual sort of a, seance or you know like a, your act, action or a community in transition i happened to notice there on sunday skip that it was lucky if there was one man for every 10 women in that audience in, in the and act I, audience are you talking yeah, about the act the act audience right and, I, and i'm making i'm just making this off no, the top of my head no you're quite right you're but, you're quite right, and they are the they are the glue. And yeah. I actually so Penelope did is you are you are still um, you know a spiritual divine feminine exemplar. Sure, let um, I do want to discuss that um, the act event yesterday, but. Let, let us just close off on this uh, coronation assumption thing with the last paragraph that Edinger said. And then I want to briefly discuss the ACT um, event yesterday, which you can find on the channel. And uh, I, I have a couple of announcements. Um, so um, the last paragraph, which, um, which uh, Miles reminded me to talk about. Um, but this is the last paragraph that Dr. Edinger wrote in this book, so it's important. Uh, the goal of the incarnation cycle, like the goal of individuation, is the conjunctio. The time has come for the psychic opposites, heaven and earth, male and female, spirit and nature, good and evil, which have long been torn asunder in the Western psyche to be reconciled. Simple as that. That's what it's all about. Um, and, and I just, um, 
that reminds me, Skip, I just uh, texted about, I've been trying all my life to find individuation alone. And although I was 20 years married um, and recently divorced, there's a conundrum, maybe it's the conunquio you're talking about, about being really whole as an individual. I find that my wholeness is more authentic when I'm actually in a relationship. Yes, obviously. Yeah, I mean, that's what yin and yang are about. And, um, Do you say you're more authentic when you're in relationship? Yes. Personally, personally, because yes. I think of my trauma, because of my trauma, that the alienation that I have been dealing with, yes. I need to have another person around. Yes. Yes. And I do too. I need to be able to converse at, a, at an authentic level in order to myself with yeah. another. I can't, you know, I couldn't be without others. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, so one of the very interesting things that went on yesterday, and yesterday we were uh, launching the book of ACT. Now, ACT is a local community group but it has been very successful in bringing people together and uh, really covering a lot of the ground that Dr. Jung was covering without ever talking about Jung, really. Um, and, um, and so they've been at it for about 10 years. And so this book, which is called uh, Circular Leadership, Together We Rise, is really a... Um, how-to um, book for how to put to, uh, an ACT community together in your community. And um, Miles was re relating to it yesterday as we were online, but I was juggling too many devices so I couldn't really <laughs> respond to, to Miles. But, you know, I asked him if... Uh, if there were, if he would be ready to have an act chapter in Calgary, but I know that the founders envisioned that uh, other chapters should come together, and um, you can see the book launch online, and um, it it's it's just very interesting what they do did because for one thing, what they did was they at one point broke us into groups of f four, but I ended up in a group of six only because I was also juggling cameras and microphones and stuff. But what they demonstrated is that in that group, even though people didn't necessarily know one another, there, there was an energy field created among those people. And, you know, in, in each of those four person groups and, um, and each one could bring something to the party. Now, as, as, uh, Miles correctly said in this event, which probably had a hundred people present, maybe, um, maybe fewer than that, maybe 70 or 80 people, but, it was uh, it was ten to one women, um, and some <laughs> some also very interesting men, but but ten to one women, and um, each one of them have something, and it could be a very small thing like what they could do with their grandchildren or what they could do with you know, you, if you came over to the house or whatever it was, and it could be a very small thing. And some of them are, are very big things that they could do and have done. And, and Linda Roebuck, who's the founder of ACT and who uh, got this book together, um, has obviously demonstrated that because the, this group meets once a month uh, in the sanctuary of the local Unity Church. And it, it is not a church service. It is a service about, um, you know, 
the types of things that we're talking about and um, you know it might it might be about Reiki or something else but it, but they always are bringing people together and we have to realize that always in history it's been the women who have brought the community back together when the men either went out and got lost in the woods or got killed in wars or whatever, what have you. And it was the women that made, made the society work. And you can really, I think, especially in the part of that video where they're doing this, this little group, you can really see the energy that's created and so on by that and I, I think I think there are men that are heroes though as well I mean I I see I do well I do I, see men that hopefully I think, so <laughs> I think men get a bad rap really <laughs> well there there are but you know I'll just share something I've been now the reason the reason I'm so interested in the indigenous people is in a sense a selfish reason because i i'm a father of an 18 year old and a 17 year olds and like jordan peterson i've like we all do <laughs> we we live under the threat of nuclear war and einstein said back in 1946, mm. if we don't change the way we're thinking, we're done for. We're doomed. And so I'm just thinking from a selfish point of view, all right, what are different ways of thinking? Because obviously what we're doing hasn't been working very well. And I, you know, and I do subscribe to the Bible and, and it does talk about loving your neighbor and at the same time, I'm contending with, you know, my concern for my family future, the planet future. It's occurring, there's this Truth and Reconciliation Commission happening with the Indigenous people, which I am the first to admit, they were, they were invisible to me, invisible to a lot of Canadians. Because we just basically, you know, stampeded across the country to settle this nation and you know very much like the united states and it occurred to me well there's a whole different worldview there you know when i started tuning into the report of the truth and reconciliation commission and i tuned in on youtube to bill moyer and chief faith keeper orrin lyons i'm thinking well there's there's a different way of thinking right here in my neighborhood that i've never even paid any attention to so um now what i'm saying is I now have been going to some of these sessions and there are some men like me, but I, I recently took a course and I was the only man in a class of about 25 women at a local university studying this subject. Now, again, there's all sorts of perhaps reasons, but nevertheless, uh, as Skip is saying, the numbers seem to indicate there's a few good men, but there's a heck of a lot more good women that are leading the charge on some of these things. And they're doing it very uh, quietly and behind the scenes and always have done. I mean, grandma has always done something for her family, whoever that is, you know, whatever grandma, whoever grandma was over the last 2000 years. She was always holding her family together and her family into the community in some way. That's what they were doing. And the men were going off, you know, uh, on hunting trips and would be away for months at a time. And, um, you know, when the men's movement was going in the 1990s, uh, they were, you know, Hillman and others were saying, you know, it's, it's archetypal for father to be away, for there to be no father, and, um, or no father present. Um, and, you know, when I was breaking up with my first wife, uh, she made a, 
a catastrophic mistake in trying to keep me in the marriage. And that was that she gave me two, two books on what it feels like to be a child uh, in, a, in a marriage that breaks up. And this, these books were filled with success stories of people like Leonardo da Vinci and, and you know, many others, scores of others uh, who were geniuses, but they were the children of broken homes. And uh, so that didn't bring me back into the marriage at all. That simply said, it's okay to go, because this is an archetype. And, um, and, in a se- I mean, I, at this point, I have to say that while I regret missing the growing up years of my daughters, I don't feel that it affects my relationship with them today, <clears throat> per se, the fact that I was not there. Um, and they got a stepfather who was a very good, who is a very good man, uh, too, and four stepbrothers and sisters, which was also good. And, and, um, and, you know, they basically saw their mother drive me out of the marriage. And what I see in them now is three very stable women who aren't going to force their husband out of the marriage that they're in. I'm very hopeful of that fingers crossed. But, um, but anyway, um, I urge you to take a look at this um, two hour video that I, was posted yesterday on the act book launch, and just see the, the type of community that these people have put together in Annapolis. And um, yeah, I watched the uh, live session while you were doing it. And uh, uh, also made a comment that it's it's uh, a live demonstration of the whole process, but you normally would not see that. And I'm glad the people agreed, or I don't know if they'd agreed or not, but you you filmed them. But as they sat together, and they uh, did a first, they did an induction, which is to get everybody's consciousness settled down and get out of the ego mind. Right. Uh, and then they did a meditation and this is a, a it's not really a new process gift. We use no, it's in, not a, it's not a new process. Yeah, We use it, it in creative leadership all the time. We induce and we get people down to where in the creative zone mm-hmm. and we get them talking and sharing and uh, valuing each person's contribution. Right. of how can you work on this problem? And we do this in business. And it's not just women. And men, it's also men. And, uh, you know, this it works for all the uh, process. So I encourage people to look at that process because it works. Right. And, and, you leave, and, and we you, need the, those processes happening in communities everywhere. Yeah, it should spread no matter what the subject might happen to be. You can use this process. Uh, and it's almost a, it's almost like, I think Nancy, you do centering prayer and stuff like that. It's very, probably similar to, yeah. to that in terms of the groups that get together. Uh, it's just my understanding. I, I haven't done it, but I understand the centering prayer groups uh, get together. And, uh, well, in centering prayer, uh, there is the quieting of oneself and yeah. going within and being present to uh, the greater personality. And that would be God for me as a Christian. Yeah, Um, but these are all people who've fallen out of the church, basically. Um, But you could see the presence coming up in the room. Yes, Uh, right. So they they connected with the God and they connected with the oneness. And that process does that, and you can see it. And I encourage you to watch it to the end. And in terms of, and you form the circle uh, around, right. Right. which is the uh, you know, you're in a safe place. You're in a 
protected area. They were yeah. all in circles. Everybody's you know. holding hands and and yeah. interacting. Right. Um, so it's it's a and, wonderful process to use. Uh, and what I like about it is particularly is that it is outside the church. In fact, they were emphatic that when I gave my talk um, two weeks ago, co-sponsored by them, uh, they were emphatic that I was not proselytizing any specific religion. Um, and, now, Skip, will they allow you to proselytize, you know, the individuation process with them? Well, I guess you did. Nobody took offense to it. But, you know, for example, what if you were to show uh, the diagram of the of um, the self uh, pulling Mercurius out of the earth, you know, and I'm well, thinking... I don't, I don't think you can show people that image. Um, I guess not. But, but to be, me, I was just because, going to say... You know, because, I mean, I'll just show people what we're talking about. This is an image from uh, the 16th century by alchemists who were talking about imagery of uh, Christianity. <laughs> and, and so... Well, uh, something like Christianity. I've never seen the... Well, it's, the it's alchemy, right? Pulling. Yeah, it's the alchemy. But what right. I'd like to point out is, we, you know, Jesus was pulled out of the alchemy sure. because he was born out of Mary. And Mary was born out of the alchemy and and we are indeed all pulled out of the out of that alchemy, uh, right. just like Jesus was. And so, as you always say, Jesus is a brother. He's not up there, you know. He's yeah. And we are to we are to incarnate and individuate in some form as well, you know. Right. But there's so, this yeah. connection. So anyway, I I think that communities like this, if they could get going around the world, uh, it's outside the context of uh, a traditional religion. Um, I think some of those people are members of the Unity Church, which is a church that rec recognizes all religion. Um, but, you know, that, that meeting that they have once a month, they're it's not about that. Deb and I went to one a couple of years back that was really beautiful. It was a man telling the story of um, his wife getting cancer and she was near death and so on. And his story is unbelievable because it goes on for like two hours. And, and then he, uh, at the end, he introduces his wife who's very much still alive and and uh, it was just a tremendously up, uplifting message that he had. Um, and so, you know, they do programs like that, and it's a once a month, once a month program type uh, thing. So it's it's a very good thing that would be easy to organize everywhere. Yeah, they're into uh, the holistic area too. You mentioned. I'd like to. I'd like to give a plug to the, um, I put it on that chat line, to Joyce Di Donato, if any of you have a chance to see her, well, to see a recording of the concert I went to on Saturday. Yeah, uh, I've, was, um, I've copied it and I'll paste it into Google. Um, I will do that. I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to sleep. It's 3.01 a.m. Oh, going, you have to go to, you have to <laughs> sleep. Right, yeah. I'm going to go and get some right, rest. But I'll, see you. You, I'll see you all again. Thank, right. you, thank you. Thank for you for joining me. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, you're welcome. It was lovely. And thank invited. you. Good night. Good night. Good night, Penelope. Good night. Um, so Good night. Um, just a couple of quick announcements. One is that I had a communication with uh, Thomas Arst uh, a day or so ago. It might have been this morning. I, my days are running together. But in any case, he... Uh, is the executive director of the Durkheim Center in the Black Forest and um, is one of the uh, co-author or co-editors of Young's Red Book for Our Time. Uh, so you see his name on the cover here. And um, 
Dr. Thomas has, among other things, spent 20 years looking at the correspondence uh, and the issues raised. Thomas was trained as a PhD physicist, not a psychologist, but he then got into social work, basically. Um, and so he has spent 20 years studying the conjunction uh, between uh, Wolfgang Pauli and Dr. Jung, and he's agreed to do a session to the advanced reading group um, sometime after the first of the year. He can't do it before then, um, but he has said that he would be happy to meet with us and make a presentation to us about that particular thing, and I thought that that's uh, that's very, fantastic. Very that's valuable. Great. And um, also, uh, for those of you who are uh, members of the advanced reading group, um, last week's session uh, engendered a, a bunch of reactions from various members of the advanced group. So uh, I hope by tomorrow. I am going to uh, send to the advanced group a potpourri of the various emails that came to me uh, from various members um, and all different perspectives. And I hope that you'll have time after, you know, it'll probably be tomorrow, tomorrow night, to take a look at that potpourri. And uh, we should dedicate. Uh, Wednesday to a discussion of those issues that have been raised. Um, and uh, I think it's a very good sign that people have um, been willing to um, discuss these issues, but I think that we need to discuss them uh, in, in order to have uh, a suitable uh, uh, what conjunctio of the group before we go on further. And so I, I wish that everyone would look at this, these various emails and uh, consider their contents seriously. Okay. So, um, and I don't, uh, I don't know if you're a member, Brendan, or have, you haven't joined. Yeah, you send me, you send me those. I have to confess that I am busy a yeah. lot, especially uh, one of the things I have coming up is we're performing, I'm conducting Handel's Messiah on the um, 8th of December. And it's taking oh a lot gosh. of my time up. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> That's a big job. It is, uh, but it's a wonderful, it's, it's a, it's, it makes me think about that group you just mentioned because what we do is we get 100 performers together and uh, maybe not many more in the audience, but it's a wonderful unifying experience taking the magic of something written 300, 400 years ago to combine all, everything, everything. So it's wonderful. Yeah. But I also have a group myself that I take around to houses, to people's homes, just to play chamber music. And the same thing happens. Just singing. Uh, it it singing creates an energy field when you do it does. that. It's wonderful. Yeah. Um, so there may might be some take home points there too, uh, because maybe there's something other than music that might come out of those energy fields too. Um, well, I'm talking about energy fields and Dr. Arts. Um, you know, I pulled it off the article that you posted in the previous session. Carl Gustav Jung, Quantum Physics and the Spiritual Mind, a mystical right. vision for the 21st century. You know, tonight we've talked about this conjunctio of indigenous peoples and Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism and baptism. And, you know, I, we didn't get too much into Buddhism, but also now, you know, quantum physics, it all, it all comes together here. You know, it's... Mm -hmm. It's, it's interesting in that respect. Yeah. Um, so I, I will com consider it a pyrrhic victory if I can get Paul Vanderclay in any conversation that I have with him 
not to mention the distinction between the Christian Reformed Church and the Reformed Church in America. <laughs> that would be a terrific start. <laughs> You're asking for it. <laughs> Pardon? You're asking for it. <laughs> well, I'm asking for it. I, I want. I want. I want. I want religious leaders to stop slicing and dicing and start unifying. Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, yeah. And that's. Uh, yeah, I also wanted to say I appreciate Brandon uh, reading Rumi and yeah. talking about the non-dual approach and. Uh, I would. Uh, I never understood Rumi until I had an experience, and once you have an experience, you understand Rumi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can't understand Rumi until his interactions is with himself within, and uh, it is the conjunctio of speaking. Uh, and I think that is just absolutely s stunning. So I would yeah. recommend Rumi. Yeah, there's a wonderful CD of some American guy, or maybe Canadian. I can't remember his name, but he just reads a yeah. translation. Yeah, Colvin Barks. Yeah, Colvin Barks. That's it. Yeah. Colvin Barks. I yeah, saw him in person. He was great. He translated a lot of he translated a lot of Rumi, and of course, we needed a lot of people to do that preliminary work before any of us could really get into these various issues and probably take another couple of centuries before we're seriously into it but um just amazing i like i yeah. love Rumi's thing which i can't do justice to but it's something like someone knocked at the door i open it i've been knocking from the inside it's been knocking from the inside or something like that <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. he's, he's got some <laughs> oh, wonderful stuff. Yeah, and, and he's still trans from... he's still translating. Uh, apparently, he wrote quite a bit of stuff, and uh, he's still translating yeah. lots of it. Yeah, he's done a lot of interesting work with uh, with Sufism, especially. Uh, um, and of course, Sufism is considered uh, what apostate in in Islam, but. Uh, nonetheless, it's the, the mystical tradition within Islam, and uh, and it's where you get whirling dervishes and that sort of thing. Um, so, anyway, okay, we better hang up, I guess. And thank you all for being here tonight. And I'll, thank you. I'll thank see you if I can cut and paste. I'll try to cut and paste this so that there's a decent presentation to the to the YouTube channel. Thank you for. Okay. And, Thank you. Uh, yeah, if you have something that you maybe after going through the uh, the Christian archetype, we ought to lighten up on the religion side for a bit and talk about some some other aspect of Jung. Although from my perspective, it's all about religion. But um, if you have any ideas of topics we should discover, we should discuss next week or in the future, please let me know. I would like to. I would like to find out about Freud and Jung. Oh my goodness! Okay. Just that so many people say, well, it's it's Freud or it's Jung. It's a, there must be a lot that's in common. There must be a lot that's respectful. In fact, sure, there is. A, there's a huge amount that's respectful, including uh, Jung's uh, eulogy of Freud, uh, which is quite touching. Um, but the fundamental difference, uh, Jung would, uh, and there are many, but the fundamental point that Jung made, he said, I would still be um, sitting at Freud's feet if only he could get off his materialistic bent. He was stuck on materialism and he wouldn't consider um he wouldn't consider religion and wouldn't understand what religion meant um and he was uh, he was a non-observing jew of course and um 
and Freud had a very difficult life, um, there, no doubt about it. I mean, he became an, ex an exile from, from uh, Austria and ended up living most of the end of his life in uh, London. And he got cancer of the jaw. And uh, there's uh, who, uh, Irving Stone did a wonderful bio biographical novel, which you can get in Audible. And I read in Audible more than 30 years ago, but it's uh, as many of Stone's books are terrific. But this particular one is called, um, I don't remember. <laughs> I'm sorry, but but um, uh, look up Irving Stone and biography of Freud, and you'll find it right away. It's a terrific book. Something related, I'm not sure if you have the expertise, however, is why is it that Jungian depth psychology is, from what I gather, hardly part of any curriculum in most of the schools of psychology, because the um, because the logos took over, and yeah, and they fire. What can we do about that? And you know, I because I've I don't think we have to do anything about it. It's okay. happening, uh, and this is why. Remember Jordan Peterson, right? And Jordan Peterson ran himself right off the rails uh, with his saving the logos thingy um, and ended up in, in rehab as a result. Um, and, and so, and the problem is that, that is our whole health insurance system and especially mental health is, is ruled by the DSM. And so they want to, want to just give drugs. If you're depressed or something, they just want to give you a drug. Well, I'm reading about some of these drugs because I'm trying to understand Jordan Peterson's situation. And it says, man, if you take these drugs, then you're going to be cut off from your emotional side forever. Um, you, know, you may not, you may not um, be depressed anymore, but you're also not, not ever going to be happy again. And uh, I mean that to me, that's totally shocking. But and totally untrue. It's untrue. What's yeah. untrue? What's I untrue? I don't believe. Well, I mean, I don't know what drugs you're talking about particularly, unless it's something that is going to uh, be um, deeply uh, psychotropic and is going to leave you with an addiction that uh, does not allow you to be yourself anymore. But speaking as somebody who's been on an antidepressant for the last 10 years, I cry and I laugh. I mean, I'm healthily in touch with my emotions. I find that really irresponsible of a doctor to tell you that. Well, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not just one where I've heard that, Brendan. But, um, but you know, my concern is that... Um, we lost 72,000 people to suicide last Correct. year. And Correct. about half of them were on antidepressants. And um, three peer people in my personal close circle are among those 72,000. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm talking about the son of my brother-in-law, um, the son of a very close friend and um, and someone who I am not at liberty to mention but his daughter and and it's really atrocious and his and his daughter was in one of these psychedelic programs at the University of Maryland at, um, and and so, you know, I don't know anything about this field, and I don't want to get no, myself. No, and I don't started. either. And, and I, I don't, all I'm saying I, is, I don't, don't want to. Don't paint the whole lot as bad. 
Well, yeah, fair enough. And what Jordan Peterson said is, if your society gives something, gives you something that's going to help you with your depression, you should take it. Okay, and yeah. and so uh, in your case, it was helpful. In his case, and he should know better because he's a professional psychologist of international repute. It, it made him end up in a in a rehab center this summer, and. Um, and he got way more addicted than even he thought could happen. And well, my my th question was is just brought forward because I, in the recent past, I've encountered two young people who have studied psychology, you know, at the undergraduate level in universities. And I've said, oh, I'm really interested in, the, in Jung, you know, and I talk about the Carl Jung Depth Psychology Reading Group. And they kind of look at me like, Oh, young, yeah, I've heard something about young, you know, and I'm like, what, you know, there is not in the curriculum. No, it's not in the curriculum. It's not taught anywhere, really. I mean, there's there's a professor at Vanderbilt who who did a, and this is in the Dropbox. Uh, his name is Gay. I can't remember his first name at the moment, but if you look in the basic Dropbox, you can find his curriculum for a Jungian course, um, but he's one, but the only other ones are Pacifica and Saybrook University and uh, one or two others in the, in the country that offer it. I tried to offer a Jungian course in, as an adjunct and I got no takers. Um, you know, they'd be happy to take me if I want to teach business law or accounting. But if I want to teach that, nobody nobody's interested in. And uh, so the psychologists that are controlling um, educational research money and grants and that sort of thing uh, in the United States, at least, are all Freudians um, for the most part. And... You know, even Jordan Peterson, who talks a good game, he, you know, he keeps saying, and I got this from Jung, I got this from Jung, et cetera, and he keeps referring to Jung, but he doesn't, he doesn't understand Jung at all. He's, he's, on the, he's on the wrong side, and he hasn't understood that all of Jung's work from 1913 on was about the arrows, it wasn't about the logos at all. And, and uh, he never cracked that, uh, you know, he never cracked it. And so, yeah, he, he pulls out a lot of Jungian concepts in his talks around the world, you know, as one-off, it's like one-off quotes here's here's something that Jung said okay well that's cool but he 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 didn't get it he didn't and you know I had a comment from someone who's a respected Jungian I won't say who but who said thank God that I'm doing what I'm doing because Jordan Peterson is so shallow and one-sided you know he's so deeply into the logos that he can't give the arrows any room. And he tried to make that up, perhaps, by doing his, his 13 lectures on the Bible. Um, and, uh, you know, I know that Paul and others are anxiously awaiting his recovery and hoping that he'll start talking about Exodus so they can understand Exodus from a psychological point of view. But it's all logos. And, um, you know, and, um, Nancy has commented that these meetings are sometimes a little bit too logos, but we can't we can't crack these things if we don't talk about them. And when we use words, we're in the logos, of course, all the time. Um, yeah. Well, we use some Rumi and poetry and different things here today. And 
Okay, well, that so was... So we did a little. Two <laughs> percent. I don't think we get eye marks. <laughs> I think we fail from Nancy's point of view. And I, well, I, sure. I, think, I think if we share uh, our experiences of what Young is talking about, I think that brings in the arrows, the life, how it's being translated into real life. Right? Yeah. Whenever, I mean, this has happened in our group uh, periodically, and it's always uh, a wonderful experience for me. From, I agree with you, and I would say that I'm, I'm trying to catch up, I think, for with everybody here, in that I haven't actually individuated, but I'm, well, I you know, I'm going to... Uh, you know, at least, don't at least, miss, <laughs> don't miss as I said, through I, me. <laughs> well, you know, but you're doing your channel. You've created a community of over seven thousand people. That to me is is a really big accomplishment. You're, you know, you're you got your website going. You're now connecting with the um, a community of transition. So to me, you know, you you've got some stuff definitely underway for a long time. But I, you know, I and I would like to. I'm going to, you know, do what Nancy is saying, and I'd like to, you know. In fact, I'm going to just offer myself up as a test case, you know. In a sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and you can all you can all just monitor me, and uh, you know. Well, my, uh, Miles, you're you're very definitely individuating. Okay. Well, I hope no so. You know, but what I'd like to just add, you know, talking about Paul Vanderclay and Jordan Peterson and this concept of Christocentrism, which again, I totally understand because get a load of this. When I got baptized at the uh, local Baptist church, I even contacted Charles Stanley to see if he would like to come to my baptism. You know, that's how, and of course, they gave a nice reply. They said, no, you know, that's how I invited people from all around the country. People came up from the United States. My wife thought, you know, you don't have to go overboard with this baptism. But anyway, you know, I'm just saying, like, I'm totally on board with the person of Jesus Christ. However, you know, what this is pointing out to me, and here this is from Paul Vanderclay, an introduction to Warren Mills. Just retrieved this today. Quote of Warren Mills, very nice gentleman from Australia, um, but very Christocentric. He said, Faith, hope, and love leads us to Jesus Christ. And I would say, Yes, and agape, the supreme ethic. Again, he just ends, all these Christocentric people, they just say, oh, you're led to Jesus Christ, then now just rest in the grace. And that's a really nice place to be chained up, you know, or uh, locked into. But I don't, that is not what we're here to be sitting on our laurels. And it's not work, it's just being. You know, it's life, as you're saying, it's eros. Right. And then, and then um, he went on to say, that he was really encouraged by Tom Holland and his book Dominion and goes on to say that, you know, all these great minds of Western history were Christian. And uh, Tom Holland is giving more depth to that story that, you know, Christians are, are, are the be all and end all. And it's like, hold it folks. No, no, you know, well, that's and, not what Jesus said. And we, we have to remember historically that anybody that wasn't was getting burned at the stake by the Catholic Church. So um, that's, that's this Christocentrism. And it's, yeah. I, I think they're missing the life, you know, as you're always saying, and Nancy, you're talking the arrow side of things. And, and um, that's where I, you know, I just for Brandon, um, I found, I got really excited when I found this Vatican Council II. Did the, Arctic, did the Catholic Church change its position on the salvation of non-Christians? Um, yes. Fascinating. I didn't know that. You know, and it's, it, they're actually opening up from Vatican II that, hey, yeah, other people, even if you're non-Christian, could be saved. 
So that was yep. really quite traumatic for me to find that. They have a so long way to go. I mean, they do. You know, Bishop Barron was. Uh, yeah, I mean, the point is that both Paul Vanderclay and Bishop yep. Barron <laughs> assume that you're going to come into the church so they can start teaching you. Okay, but and so, sure, if you if you're prepared to come into the church to learn, then naturally the archetypes are going to bring you along. Um, and it, as long as you leave yourself open to it, it will work. It works regardless, uh, Protestant or Catholic. But mm -hmm. the problem, pardon? Sorry. But the problem is getting over that first hurdle. It might be a, li a little one. It might be a rope across the road. But if you can't bring people to the catechism, Bishop Barron says, well, maybe we have to teach the, the catechism better. Well, maybe you have to teach people to get to the catechism <laughs> first. You have to be meaningful in their life somehow. Correct. You're absolutely right. Because, sure, the catechism has worked for 2,000 years, plus or minus, as, as the church has developed, and it, and it would do it, it. You know, it's been refined over th thousands of years now. But the question is, why do I cross the threshold to hear the catechism in the first yeah, place? Yeah, why bother? Yeah, why bother? You know, all those people are nice Catholics. Let them go to church. That's all fun, well and good. I, I mean, I'm just being facetious here, but um, but that's <laughs> I mean that's the threshold we need to get the theologians across the other way. Okay, they have to come out of the church and bring people in, um, and they have to be shepherds again, and fisher, yeah. and fishers of men and women. Yeah. Again, um, and they need to open the door that was yours standing behind and closed. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so I, I don't know. Nancy, you look like a cat that fa f swallowed a canary. I don't know. I'm just tired. <laughs> okay, I'm going to let you go. <laughs> don't, talk about, don't talk about her canary, so... Okay. <laughs> I, do a, I do have a couple of birds that keep me company. One's a green singing finch, which is a beautiful singer. Uh huh. Well, that's lovely. Um, okay, I'm going to let everybody go. Yeah. All right. Good night. Let, yeah. we, we'll it's think. Nice. We'll, Brendan, we'll think about the the young Freud thing as a topic. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Good night, everybody. All right. Peace. Good night, everyone. Good night. Peace. Bye-bye. Sleep well. Bye-bye.